All right, good morning, church. The Lord is good and faithful and here with us. Uh, we're we're going to be in Luke chapter 13 today, Luke 13, as we study verses 22 through 30. And the focus of this morning's passage is entering through the narrow gates. Now, most in here, I'm sure, are familiar with that expression, right? You know, it's the only proper route to salvation. And Jesus discusses it when he is asked a specific question about people's, people getting saved. And today, we'll find that Jesus communicates the importance of everyone making that personal decision to come through that narrow gate and the tragic eternal result for those who choose not to. Uh, Let's get right into our passage this morning and receive the Lord's instruction. We're going to be in, again, Luke 13, verses 22 through 30. Will you pick up with me there? It says, And he went through the cities and villages, teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. Then one said to him, Lord, are there few who are saved? And he said to them, strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able. When once the master of the house has risen up and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and knock at the door saying, Lord, Lord, open for us. And he will answer and say to you, I do not know you. Where are you from? Then you will begin to say, We ate and drank in your presence, and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know you. Where are you from? Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and yourselves thrust out, they will come from the east and the west, from the north and the south, and sit down in the kingdom of God. And indeed, there are last who will be first, and there are first will be last. Lord, thank you so much for your love, and thank you for this day that we can come into your house and worship you and smile at one another, and Lord, just even lean upon one another at this time, Lord, seeking counsel and seeking advice, and Lord, just coming into your presence and getting the counsel of your word right now, and what a sober and serious passage we have, and yet, Lord, I know you want to work in our hearts right now. Lord, help us to prioritize you and help us to uh, just be attentive to what you have for us today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. And as you saw, Jesus, he speaks truth, right? Serious truth. You know, through his instruction, we see that there is to be determination. There is to be dedication. And most notably, there is to be a personal decision to come to the Lord for salvation. But it all begins when Jesus is heading to Jerusalem. Let's, Let's pick back up in verse 22, where it says, And he went through the cities and villages, teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. This is actually a very significant statement. And I, I know that we've, we've, uh, we have a lot of g- the Gospel of Luke to cover still, right? I mean, we're like, like halfway done. But of Jesus' three-plus-year earthly ministry, there are possibly only months remaining. And what's so significant about Jesus traveling toward Jerusalem is that his miss- mission of going to the cross, and being that sacrifice for all humanity, is drawing near. That time is drawing near. But knowing great hardship and suffering was soon to be upon him, you know, Jesus wasn't like, you know, I don't want to be bothered, just leave me alone. He didn't do that. You know, what I'm heading out to do is going to be tough. So what I want to do is just disconnect the next few months and be on my own. He doesn't do that. Jesus continues to minister. He goes through many cities and villages teaching people the truth about the kingdom of God. And we've been reading about his compassion and care for the lost and broken along the way. I mean, I think about the glorious work Jesus did last week when he was teaching in the synagogue. I mean, he did call out the hypocrisy of a cranky critic. I love that. (laughs) But even better was Jesus' healing of a woman who had been in misery, literally bent in half for the past 18 years because of an oppressive attack by Satan. Jesus, he saw this woman, he saw her in need, and he took the time to work in her life. And I think, that's Jesus, right? (laughs) That's Jesus. Yes, he still had the biggest task uh, still ahead of him, the cross, but he used his time to touch people's lives. And I'm like, may that be an exhortation for us, Christ followers, to do the same. You know, to use our time, however long it is, to further the kingdom of God. You know, Jesus has called us to be salt and light in this world, who, who are to shine and share with the lost. And looking around this world, I think you can conclude that there, there are many lost, many without the truth of the gospel. 
And I believe our Lord's example to us should encourage us not to put in like the minimum time, <laughs> but overtime, right? <laughs> overtime in the sharing and shining department. Because our Lord desires people to be saved, and he wants to use us to lead people to him. Can I get an amen to that? Which leads us to the important question of the day asked to Jesus regarding people's salvation. Look at the first part of verse 23. It says, Then one said to him, Lord, are there few who are saved? This man asks, Lord, are there few who are saved? Well, I read that question, and honestly, I'm like, that's kind of a weird way to phrase a question, <laughs> isn't it? Like, don't you think? I mean, like, I understand the question by the Philippian jailer in Acts 16 who saw, who experienced that great earthquake and goes to Paul and Silas and says, you know, what must I do to be saved? I get that. Or even how a skeptic came to Jesus in Luke 10 and cynically asked, like, teacher, what must I do to inherit inter- eternal life? I understand that. I'd even be fine with the curious, you know, Jesus, how many people throughout all human history will get saved? I mean, that's something I'd like to know. <laughs> what would you like to know? How many people are really saved? I understand those questions. But this one, Lord, are there few who are saved? It sounds odd. To me, it's almost like this man is prompted to ask this because he notices something negative taking place around him with people regarding Jesus. Like he's looking around and he perceives that people are not getting it. They're not getting all that Jesus is doing and what he's teaching. I mean, this man could have been attempting to stir up problems like many others tried to do with Jesus. But I wonder if there was, wasn't sincerity behind this question. I wonder if this man has been making some insightful observations in however long he has been following the Lord. I mean, did he see the Pharisees? Did he see them like, you know, looking like they're sucking on lemons with everything that Jesus says? But then did he also see that their hard-hearted responses to Jesus and those he was touching? Did he see many in the crowd come out solely to see Jesus do the miraculous? Like the phenomenal feeding of the 5,000 plus. Only to notice them peel away when they realized Jesus wasn't going to be their like private McDonald's walkthrough service, right? <laughs> Picking up filet of fishes every time they can. Did, did this man notice that? Did he notice some disperse when Jesus told of the difficult cost of truly being one of his followers? You know, Jesus' words, if you've been with us, they've been kind of intense <laughs> as of late, right? It's not really like the feel-good message of, like, let's practice random kindness, random acts of kindness, or just give peace a chance, would you? They didn't do that. <laughs> if you recall, Jesus bluntly proclaimed things like, do you think that I came to bring peace on earth? I tell you, not at all, but division, even in the family. It's real, it's intense. And he goes on, he talks about, you know, it's not about building treasure here, but building treasure in eternity. Also, also that people are to deny themselves, pick up and their cross and follow him every day. I mean, how, how many followers seeing the healings were like, awesome, the miracles, yes, the filet of fish, yum, right? But after hearing about the cost, we're like, yeah, not for me, see you, Jesus. The, the intent of this man asking the question could have been insincere. But I'm curious, could, could, taking, could taking note of all that was occurring have prompted him to ask, Lord, are there few who are saved? Not sure, but I, I do like that he acknowledges Jesus as Lord. <laughs> That's maybe an indication of sincerity. And whatever the case, Jesus answers. Notice that at, at the end of verse 23, it says, and he said to them, see that, to all who are there, The man asks the question, but Jesus turns his his attention to everyone in the crowd as he speaks. And then he says, verse 24, Strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able. You know, Jesus, his response, it reminds me of what happened when he was approached by some Jerusalem Jews at the beginning of this chapter and, and told Jesus about the Galileans who were murdered by Pilate. Do you remember that? The group there, they wondered, why were they slaughtered? But instead of getting into a long discussion about all the reasons for suffering in this world, Jesus, he gets personal. He, he turns to them and he says, after they ask, like, the sin did, what is the reason? He turns to them and says, unless you repent, you will likewise, you will all likewise perish. Here it's similar. Instead of directly answering, are there few who are saved? Jesus turns and says, you need to get saved. That's what he says. You know, I think many people today, they ask questions about others, don't they? 
I, I think about the infamous one that goes something like this. I'm, I'm sure you've heard it. What about the person on a desert island who never gets a chance to hear the gospel? What will happen to them? I mean, we've heard that, right? Personally, I wonder if Jesus would use the same approach with that question, which would be, I understand your concern for them and their salvation, but you better get concerned about your own salvation. <laughs> you're hearing the gospel right now, so you're without an excuse. You must respond to it. You need to get saved. That's what Jesus is doing here in this passage. Are there few who are saved? Jesus is like, you better get saved. <laughs> That's what he's saying. He doesn't directly answer the question. Do you notice that? But then again, in Jesus' response, the answer to the question is revealed. The gate being narrow and, and many not entering shows the answer to the question is yes. There are only few that are saved. Uh, of course, throughout history, there have been multitudes, right? Multitudes. But unfortunately, the majority of people in each generation do not come to Jesus. Sober reality. Right away, though, I, I think you can see that Jesus' answer, it flies in the face of universe, universalism, which, which is the idea that it doesn't matter what you believe, that, that God, you know, he'll just accept everyone into heaven. Some people believe that. He'll just accept everybody. Let me say this. God will accept everyone into heaven who comes through Jesus. Jesus paid the price so all people can be saved. John 3.16, we know this, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That word whoever, it can also be translated all. All means all. All who believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The apostle John also recorded this Holy Spirit inspired statement in his first epistle, 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. It says this, and he himself, talking about Jesus, is the propitiation that is he's the acceptable sacrifice for our sins and listen to this and not for ours only but also for the whole world what this means is Jesus' sacrifice was enough to cover everyone's sin this is how powerful the blood of jesus is all people can be forgiven all people can be accepted but all must come through jesus jesus says that right john also records john 14 6 i am the way the truth and the life no one comes to the Father except through me. We read in Acts 4.12, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind, talking about Jesus, by which we must be saved. This is the answer. And the way we are to come to him, Romans 10.9 states that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved, Right? <laughs> Not might be, not, oh, it's a good possibility. You will be. You will be. You know, uh, Paul goes on to say, For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth, mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, Whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and, and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For, listen to this, For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Someone say amen to that. <laughs> this is the narrow gate. It's a narrow gate that we are to enter by. The narrow gate is belief in Jesus. It's faith in him. It's turning towards him. It's acknowledging all that he did on our behalf. The gospel. It's that Jesus saw our need. He stepped down from eternity and he did something about it. He rescued us. You know, we, we cannot earn salvation or work or to acquire it. It is freely given to all who believe someone say amen to that the skeptic but hold on time out jesus says we are to strive to enter the gate i understand the term strive strive means to exert much effort and energy which sure sounds to me like working true but let me add even more to that <laughs> many scholars point out that the word strive is a greek word Agonaz ome. Say that five times, right? <laughs> yeah. It's where we get our English word, agonize. And culturally, at this time, it was used as a term that described an athlete doing all they can to win a prize. Using all their effort, striving to do it. So in the same way, we are to strive to agonize to enter the narrow gate. 
Some of you are like, Justin, you're really not building your case. <laughs> but he's being saved by faith. This sounds like works. I get that, but here's the key. Here's the key. It's not that we are striving, we are agonizing to earn salvation. We are to strive to find the right way to salvation. What I mean is, is we are not to carry this casual, nonchalant kind of attitude, like mentality. Oh, you know, it doesn't really matter what we, what we believe. As long as, as you're sincere, you know, God will accept you. There are many ways to God, that mentality. You know, Jesus, sure, yeah, why not? I'll add him to my list. It couldn't hurt. The more, the better, right? I'll add him as well. No, Jesus is not to be part of the list. He must be the list. He is the list. And we must fully be convinced in our heart that he is the way. We need to come to that conclusion. We are to strive to find the right gate, the right answer, the right conclusion about Jesus. Let me say it plainly. No one is saved by works. Jesus does the work on our behalf and saves. But we should make every effort to come to the conclusion that he is the only answer for salvation. We should strive. We should be serious because this is eternal life that we are talking about. I mean, think about how people strive in this world. Think about what they strive for, what they agonize for. It's much less than that, right? People strive to be happy. People strive in their careers. They str strive for success. They strive for accomplishments, for, for health, for goals, for rewards. I think this is true. I read an article about a 45-year-old CEO who spends $2 million a year trying to reverse aging in his life. The article says, says he, he quote this, look, he follows a strict diet, sleep, sleep wind down ritual, exercise regimen, takes a round of daily supplements, and undergoes countless medical tests. Listen to this, as he strives for the biological age of 18. <laughs> he wants to be 18. I'm like, just give it up, dude. <laughs> I mean, we all, we all want to look young, but come on, like, seriously. And, you know, like, the people strive for these things. I mean, talking about athletes as, as one of the definitions of striving. An athlete striving for a prize. I was reading about Michael Phelps. I mean, you know, the Olympic swimmer. I know he's old news now. <laughs> but he still is the most medaled Olympic medalist, I think, right? 28 medals, 23 gold. Big deal. I read about his training. It says Phelps swam 13 kilometers, 8 miles a day. Six to seven days a week. You want to know determination? He even did it on his birthday. He would make sure he swam. So in addition to weight training, he would spend five to six hours in the pool a day. I'm not motivated to work out for 30 minutes a day, right? <laughs> Additionally, if Phelps would take ice baths, spend time stretching, get regular massages, and make sure he had a ton of sleep so he was ready all the time for what he had to do. Eating-wise, he would eat eight to 10,000 calories a day. Average is like 2,500 for, for a man his size. I, if he didn't eat so much, he would lose 10 pounds a week because he was training so hard. This was his life. His regimen was radical. And you gotta commend that. I'm kind of like, <laughs> like, what am I doing in my life, right? Go for a walk at least or something, right? But what is he doing it for? For medals, for something temporary. And believe me, I'm not mocking, uh, I'm not knocking Michael Phelps. I'll, I'll knock the CEO <laughs> a little, but not Phelps. I mean, his commitment is, 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 it's inspiring, isn't it? Isn't that inspiring? I especially love that he said in an interview his favorite part of the Olympics was to represent his country. So, you know, kudos to that. I appreciate that. But what do we, people strive in life. People are striving th for things, right, to get ahead in life, to acquire things, whatever it may be, to press on in this life. What about regarding eternal life. <laughs> Shouldn't we all want to strive to know what's right? What the truth is? And Jesus is the one who tells us the truth, right here. And he is the one who has the authority to do it. He's the one who wrote this, <laughs> right? He's speaking this. And he tells us there is only one gate that we are uh, to strive to enter in. And that is the narrow one. Which means, if there is a narrow one, then there's another one. <laughs> there's a wide one. He talks about that in Matthew 7. He says this, Enter by the narrow gate. Listen, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. There are two gates. Two gates. The narrow and the wide. The right and the wrong. The gospel. Belief in Jesus is the narrow. 
while any and everything else is wide. Trying to earn salvation by good works, wide. All other belief systems, religions, philosophies, outside of the true Jesus of the Bible, wide. Being religious, wide. Even trusting in one's background and upbringing is the wide gate, which was the problem with the Jews at this time. They thought being a physical descendant of, of Abraham meant they were in a good standing with God. Some today think that. Some today they say, you know, I'm good with God because I'm part of this denomination. I was baptized as a baby into this church, so I'm good. Or, you know, my family has this track record of service, so I am good with God by association, right? That makes it count. No, it's not true. That's not what Jesus says. It cannot be the case. The only way to be saved is the narrow gate, which is belief in Jesus. Amen? <laughs> it's having a personal relationship with him. Look at verse 25. It says, When once the master of the house has risen up and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open for us. And he will answer and say to you, Notice this, I do not know you, where you are from. The response, I do not know you, shows us that salvation is not about being religious or our background, or even our goodness outweighing our bad. It's about knowing Jesus, who the master of the house clearly represents. It's about coming into a relationship with him. This is the only answer to salvation. The the only answer to not being locked outside once the door is shut is Jesus. And what Jesus means by, by by this isn't that there is only so much space. <laughs> there's, only, there's only enough room for only a few people to be saved. No, it's, it's, it's that there is only a certain amount of time that each person has before the door closes on them. C- capacity can, cannot be the issue. You know, when we were studying Revelation, in chapter 21, we were given the dimensions of the New Jerusalem, the, the heavenly city, heaven. Which is so fascinating, it's, it's shaped like a cube. A- and in modern calculations, it would be measured approximately 1,500 miles long, wide, and deep. Which equals 3.375 billion cubic feet. So just some information. <laughs> You're like, what does that mean? What, what, does that, what does it have to do with anything? I'll tell you what it means. That would be enough space to accommodate 100,000 billion people. Secular thought, secular thought, secular thought guesstimates that there have been 109 billion people throughout human history. In heaven, there's enough to accommodate 100,000 billion. That's like 0.1% of the dimensions of what is described for us in that new heaven, heavenly city, which means there is plenty of room in heaven. <laughs> God has plenty of room in heaven for everyone. Again, it's, it's not that only few can be saved. It's that few will come to the true Jesus of the Bible for salvation. And I like, I personally like that we are told to strive. He says strive. I like that we're told that because it shows, not that we work for salvation, but each person has a choice and is able to come to the Savior for salvation. And before you argue, you know, what about the part where it says many will seek to enter and will not be able to? That doesn't sound like people have a choice. Very fascinating. One author I read noted that the flow between verse 24 and 25 should be read a different way than we have. The the translators, they do their best, but sometimes it's like if you go back to the original language, it it might actually say something a little bit different. And the punctuation here might be a little different. So maybe it's not strive to enter through the narrow gate, for many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able, period, end of thought, new thought, when once the master of the house has risen and so on. Instead of that, it can be read like this. Strive to enter through the narrow gate, for many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able when once the master of the house has risen up and shut the door. Jesus' is statement it, it isn't showing that there's limited space or limited acceptance but limited time. Jesus is showing the urgency to make a personal decision to follow him. That the only time people have is while they are alive here. The choice is to be be made ASAP because tomorrow is not promised for anyone. Which again is why Jesus says to his listeners then and his listeners today, I believe in this room, strive to enter the narrow gate. Make the decision to follow Jesus before it's too late and that door is closed forever.
We have to make our choice here. But look at the response of those locked out. Jesus says, almost like he's, he's, he's speaking about what will happen. They, they will say, they will begin to say, verse 26, we ate and drank in your presence, and you taught in our streets. They're like, come on, let us in. We know all about you. We were right downstairs at IHOP eating when everything was going on. We heard the music playing. Heard Jesus a few times. Come on, we walked on by and that speaker was playing it down by the door. We're good, right? Maybe some will even be like, I went to church. I checked out a home group once. Look at this. I, we ate and drank in your presence. We're taking communion today. I participated in communion. I know what it's all about. I know what the bread represents, the body, the cup, the blood that was shed. I get that. I know all these things. I know a lot. Jesus will reply, re- will reply, but you don't know me, nor I you. There is no relationship. Verse 27, but he will say, I tell you, I do not know you. Where you are from, depart from me, all you workers of iniquity, all you evildoers. You know, without the righteousness of Christ imparted through belief in him, people are lost. People will remain lost. Those who refuse to come to Jesus, embrace the truth, those who refuse to embrace him, will be locked out for their unbelief. I mean, Jesus, he says in his prayer in John 17, he says, now this is eternal life, that they may know know you. It's in his prayer to the Father, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Eternal life is knowing Jesus. Yes, it is heaven with him, but it is knowing him. And all who don't have this, don't know him, will be commanded to depart. And their destination is not good. Verse 28. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and yourselves thrust out. He says they will come from the east and the west, from the north and the south, and sit down in the kingdom of God. And indeed, there are last who will be first, and there are first who will be last. We've heard that. But, you know, in the context, Jesus is talking to Israel, the, the Jews who thought that their identity was enough to get them saved. That they, they thought, you know, we're, we're descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, so that means we're good. <laughs> Their blood flows are ours, so we're good. We're in a great standing. Jesus says that's not the case, that they can't claim salvation because they are physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They, too, had to come through faith. They, too, had to believe in Jesus, or they will be lost forever. You know, this would be shocking. This would be shocking for them to hear. I mean, we come to church every week. We know this. But this would be shocking for them to hear. And so so with the next verse where it says, and some will come from the east and the west, from the north and the south, and sit down in the kingdom of God, and indeed there are last who will be first, and there are first who will be last. What is that talking about? Who is that? It's the Gentiles. that's That's what Jesus is talking about. The Gentiles coming from all over. They will get in. They will get in. The Jewish thought of the day, they'd be shocked. The Jewish thought of the day was that salvation was only for the Jews. Not Gentiles. That's not the case. Obviously, in the book of Acts, we see that the gospel spread to the Gentiles. It greatly impacted the Gentiles. We see that in this room, right? Many of us don't have that Jewish background, but we've come to faith. But the answer for all people, Jew and Gentile, is to come to Jesus to be saved. And those who will not, Jesus says, will experience weeping and gnashing of teeth. Those are Jesus' words. And what Jesus is talking about is hell. The place of total separation from God for all eternity. But you know, the weeping and gnashing of teeth has got to be one of the most graphic descriptions, right? I mean, what you can picture. I mean, the lake of fire, also pretty graphic, right? As it talks about being tormented day and night forever. Very graphic. But both are true. And what we get is this tragic picture for those who will not come to Jesus. If you've never made the decision for Jesus, make the decision for Jesus. He came to deliver you from this, from pain, from agony, from judgment, from suffering for all eternity. In fact, he bore that upon himself when he took the cross. He suffered and bore the wrath of judgment upon himself so we wouldn't have to. I don't like that there's only one way. Look at what the way did. The way did everything. 
You know, Jesus, who taught more on, on hell than anyone, tells us that hell was actually prepared for the devil and his angels, not for people. Jesus prepared heaven for people. I mean, uh, John 14, verse 2. We know this. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. He says, I go to prepare a place for you. And I just have to say, if Jesus is preparing it, you know it's going to be good, right? Everything he does is good. You know, Revelation, into, I, you know, I kind of wish we had more. Don't you wish we had more? Like, tell me everything about it. But he tells us enough. And in Revelation 21 and 22, you talk about beautiful. You talk about glorious. I don't know why it came to my mind, but I'm like, it's like bling beyond your, beyond, beyond your wildest dreams. It's amazing. It is going to be glorious. I mean, translucent gold. What does that even mean? I don't even know what that means. It's going to be amazing. Beauty, but you know what? It will be beautiful. There will be glorious reunions with those who've gone before us in Jesus. How amazing is that? How many are looking forward to that? How many want to take as many people with them as they can? I'm like, just hold my hand the whole rest of our lives, you know? It's going to be a place where there's fullness of joy and pleasures by His right hand forevermore, which means He is right there with us. He's right there with us. No more pain. Hallelujah, right? No more shame. No more sorrow. No more crying. This 45-year-old CEO is trying to look 18. You're going to look like you're going to radiate <laughs> in eternity. It's going to be so much better than anything you could try and do here. So no more sorrow. No more crying. He wipes those tears away from our eyes. This is what he promises people. This is what he has for people. And you know what? There's plenty of room. 3.375 billion cubic feet. <laughs> Enough room for 100,000 billion people. But some are not going to be there. That, sh that should break our hearts, shouldn't it? But what about them? <laughs> Let me just ask this. What about you? What about you? Where are you going to be? There are two different gates to enter. One is wide. One is narrow. The wide one consists of all beliefs outside of Jesus. The narrow one, it is Jesus. It is Jesus. If you've never come to him, come to him. He's done everything so that you can have eternal life freely. What you have to strive for, strive to, to look to him. Oh, but this is pulling me that way. Strive to push that away. Strive to come into his presence. Strive, strive to acknowledge that he is the way. and He does all the work. He's done it all. Think about what he went through. I, you know, as a dad, I think about the father's perspective. I don't want anything to happen to my kids. You guys pick on my kids, I'm picking back on you big time. Humanity picked on the father's kid. And the father let him go through with it. Why? So that we could be saved. Man. I don't like that God does this. Man, God did everything so that you could be forgiven, have the guarantee of eternal life, and not have to suffer weeping and gnashing of teeth, torments in the lake of fire forevermore, complete eternal separation from him. He did everything so that that loved one that believed in him, who went before you, you get to see again. He 
did everything, that even though you struggle every single day and you blow it and it breaks your heart because you keep failing and you keep falling. And it's not based upon all that you've done, but everything that he's done because your life is found in him. Man, you want to debate some like theological issues, we can debate, but just don't tell me that. That God is an incredible and merciful and full of compassion. Because we don't deserve it. And yet we get it. Man. I think this perfect day for communion, right? <laughs> so the worship team, can you guys come forward? The worship team's gonna come forward and Man, may our hearts be broken for his goodness, his compassion, his mercy, his grace, his love for us, because no one, no one has loved us as much as he does. No one cherishes us as much as he does. And he is so good that he will walk with us every single day. It's not just like, here you go, you're saved. And when you get to heaven, <laughs> give me a high five. It's not like that. He fills us. He will give us the peace that surpasses all understanding. If we come to him, thank thankfully. He is so good. And church, if you, if you, if you know him, we've got to start telling people about him. Michael Phelps could train for five to six hours a day swimming. What are we born again Christians doing? How are we spending time intimately with our Father? Are we ready to lift up those in this church who are going through it? Are we looking at this lost world and instead of snarling at them? Are we broken for them? Because without him, we read it. There's weeping and gnashing of teeth. I think there just needs to be with us some weeping for the lost. <sighs> One last thing. I, I, it, in that statement, we'll, we'll come. Some will come from the east and the west, from the north and the south sit down in the kingdom of God. And indeed, there are last who will be first. And there are first who will be last. I mean, the context, all about the context. Gentile, last will be first. Jew, first will be last. All one in Christ. But that's, he's talking about what's happening, what will happen. But looking at that, it, it makes me think, if he takes people from the west and the east, the north and the south, <laughs> Our God will take anyone. <laughs> Our Savior's blood is that powerful that anyone can be saved. But I've done all this. Jesus did that. And that is enough to enable you to walk freely in Him, to be forgiven and spend eternity with him. If you don't know him, the key is right there. It's right there. He's done it all. You just look to him. He'll change everything. Amen. Lord, thank you for your love. Thank you for grace and forgiveness and hope and purpose. I just pray right now, Lord, if anyone doesn't know you, ah, if anyone's looking to something else or trying to combine all these things and say, I got this, may they realize it's not what they need. All they need is one thing. 
and that's you. Even as we sing this song, Lord, may you open their hearts. Open their hearts. If you desire them, help them to know there's plenty of room. There's plenty of room. For all of us, Lord, who are saved, I pray, help us to get focused. Oh, Lord, return to our first love. Help us, Lord. Oh, Lord, we want to we want to repent and do those first works again, Lord. Acknowledge you. It's your, your life. Your life. And you will walk with us every single day. Work in our hearts right now. Prepare our hearts for partaking of communion. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to take communion together, so if you just hold on to the elements after they play the song, we're going to take it together.